Yes, uh, I founded PatchBay uh, about four or five years ago, really as a sort of generalized data broker for handling sensors of all types, energy monitors, biosensors, tracking ships, vehicles, pollution monitors, all these sorts of things. And what it's actually grown into is, in a sense, it's actually a community. It's, a, it's one of the most vibrant communities of Internet of Things enthusiasts and developers who are doing stuff uh, in this field all around the world. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about is just to, just to sort of introduce what I mean by the Internet of Things, because there are a thousand and one different definitions that encompass everything from, oh, it's just about plugging sensors into the Internet, to other people who just say, it's just the Internet, really. So I'll just talk about what I mean by the Internet of Things, and then I'm going to give an example of how it's been used on PatchBay. And I'm going to wrap up with something that we're calling the Internet of Things Bill of Rights, which is a sort of proposal in the working with the community to come up with a set of principles for what to do with this data that's generated by all these things out there that are slowly coming online. So there are people who will say that the Internet of Things is simply a quantitative difference from what's come before. They'll talk about things like 15 billion sensors coming online by, I don't know what year, 50 billion. Some even talk about a trillion. I would actually say that it's a qualitative difference from what's come before, because for the last two or three decades, we have had this phenomenon known as machine to machine or M to M. And in these kinds of situations, what you do is you deploy a set of sensors. It might be even a sort of oil pipeline monitoring system. It might be a set of energy monitors. And you, as a company, as an, as an organization, have deployed this set of sensors with a pretty fixed idea of what you're going to do with that data. You're probably handling the back end, or maybe you're outsourcing it. But basically, the data is effectively closed, because you've deployed a set of sensors, and you have a fixed purpose in mind, and you own the data, not the people who are the end users of those energy devices or, or what have you. In the Internet of Things, you don't know who's going to use the data that's generated by your devices. This, this is my take on it. In the Internet of Things, you don't know who's going to help you unlock the value from the data that's being generated by all these devices. In effect, it's a sort of transition from what have been known as data silos to open data. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean public data. It just means that the data that is generated by the biosensors, the energy monitors, the the, uh, the pollution sensors, what have you, the data is open to be used in other contexts. And for me, this is a qualitative difference from what's come before. The classic example of this in the industry is when Vodafone, who were tracking cell phone tower ID connections to phones, basically just what IDs are connected to this cell phone tower, made that data available to um, TomTom, who had the algorithms for extracting from the IDs as they moved from tower to tower into an idea of how the traffic was flowing. And they were then able to develop a service that was put into the TomToms of the cars, and the TomToms had a Vodafone SIM card in them um, that was able to deliver that data in real time. So in the Internet of Things, although we're seeing a lot of connected products, we're seeing things like the Nabaz tag, the Nike Plus, Fitbits, DriveWise, all of these devices, they are devices that are pushing data to the internet. But because you can't, for example, with your Fitbit, race against your friend who's got a nice Nike Plus, or if you've got a current cost energy monitor, you can't necessarily go and use the application that was developed for the Watson, we're not quite there at a situation where the data is open by default. Now, when we do get to that stage, my contention is that instead of an end consumer paying the device manufacturer for a device and a service, instead we'll see a situation where people buy devices that are generating open data, and application developers will be creating services that are actually useful for people. So what happens is the money actually flows in the opposite direction. People pay for applications, and the application developers revenue share with the hardware companies. And in this kind of situation, what you'd see is that you might have some kind of heart monitor. That data you could take to your doctor, but you could also use your, I don't know, your yoga instructor, instructors come up with an app that actually tells you something different about uh, what you might do. 
So Patch Bay, as I mentioned, is this sort of generalized data broker. It's been around for a few years. Uh, it's now been used by people in about 110 different countries. And one of the very first feeds, in fact, the feed ID is in the low hundreds, 397, was a Geiger counter that was set up in Kyoto um, in 2008 and has basically been online ever since then. In the hours and days after the tsunami in Japan um, and the ensuing crisis around the nuclear facilities there, this feed became incredibly popular on, on Patch Bay, on Twitter. People were talking about it. It was even blogged about. The problem was that this Geiger counter was in a lab hundreds of miles away from Fukushima, uh, probably behind several concrete walls, maybe even pointing in the wrong direction. Now, what happened was that the community sort of rallied around and said, wait a second, we should actually get data out there, because what was happening at the time was that the Japanese government was only releasing data once per day in PDF format and simply releasing numerals, nothing to do with what that data might mean. And so the Patch Bay community um, started creating tutorials for how to connect this Geiger counter to the web, how to uh, take this radiation sensor and plug it into Patch Bay, how to take this handheld radiation monitor and get the numbers through a web form into Patch Bay, such that within a very short time, just a few days, there were suddenly 2,000 feeds across Japan, some of which were updating several times per minute even, which was a big contrast to what had been going on um, uh, what, what the data had been coming from the government. And so on top of that data, people started building applications, such as this one by Haiyan Zhang in, in London, which actually took that data and started to represent it, not just in terms of numerals, but in terms of health consequences and change from background radiation. Somebody else built the Winds of Fukushima Android app, which basically took your geolocation and the wind direction and looking at the nearby radiation monitors inferred where it might peak next. There were other sort of visualization tools for trying to understand the trends of this data. Because, of course, in this kind of crowdsourced data set, you're not looking for the same things as you're looking for in the official data set. You're looking for, for anomalies. You're, you are looking for maxima and minima. You aren't looking to smooth out the data. You're looking for people to measure things that might not actually be measured by the official network. You're also looking for the public visibility and accountability that comes from this kind of situation where people with many different domain expertises are able to talk about the data. And so there were uh, incidents where on Twitter or on the comments threads uh, of the feeds, an expert in radiation would say, hey, this feed doesn't look like it's actually nano gray. It should be actually micro sieverts. And then the owner of that could say, yes, whoops, I made a mistake. I'll, I'll correct it. So this is a slightly different thing you're looking for in crowdsourced data, which, um, uh, which is important to understand. This is not meant to supplant the official data. And so on and so forth. More and more people started to build applications, um, web forms to basically get the data in to Patch Bay. And then eventually we started seeing these spreading around the world so that now there's lots of data feeds uh, tracking radiation in Spain and in Germany, and um, soon after that in West Coast, USA. So this is an example of the kind of thing that can occur when you have this kind of open system for tracking the sensor data in real time. But it also raises a lot of questions about what do you do with that data? Who owns that data? Who has access to it? And so in the middle of last year, we started proposing the Internet of Things Bill of Rights, which is a set, it actually started off as seven uh, points, it went up to nine, and it's now back to eight. It's constantly in flux. It's basically a, a set of principles that we would like to adhere to, and we're hoping other Internet of Things brokers would adhere to, because we fundamentally believe that people own the data that, that they create, or that their things create on their behalf. They have the right to access data that's generated through their activities, especially in public space, but this does result in logical conflicts, of course, right? The interesting thing, though, is that the concept of owning data itself is a logical conflict. Um, and so we are thinking that this Bill of Rights is actually going to start focusing much more on access rather than on the question of ownership. We're going to be having a, 
an event called the Open Internet of Things Assembly to try and finalize this uh, sometime in the next four months in, in June in London. So I hope you can come along and join. This has probably raised a lot of questions. Um, I've got a, an office hours uh, event uh, at 11.30 if you'd like to talk about it. Uh, I'd love to see you there. Thank you very much. <laughs>